I like to go a little bit a little bit early. Okay. Um, so we could just put the screen on like us, okay. um, just right. the two of us before we start that. Should I hit stop like, sharing? Yeah. I am going to quit certain things because I know it's going to start to eat up my, yeah, I think that should be fine. And I'm going to have to close a couple of things. I think that should be good. I don't have that many things open. So I'm just gonna wait for people to come in. Typically, I wait about five minutes. So once people start rolling in, I announce that we start about five minutes after the hour to allow people to trickle in. Um, so that's how I do it. So have you made your schedule lighter? I have. There's no like double booking. That's how I'm handling things. Oh, so there's attendees. I'm like talking to you as is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so there's, um, I don't announce names, so we can keep this anonymous. So hi, everyone who's just joining. Um, this is Dr. Tanzavati and Dr. Pennington, and we're just going to wait for five minutes to allow people to trickle in. It's just at the top of the hour at three o'clock. Um, before we get started, just to acquaint everybody, there are some buttons at the bottom of your screen, and if you um, want to pose a question to us, we're going to present for about 20 to 30 minutes, and you can put your question in the Q&A box down below. That does get um, broadcast to everybody so we can all see. In the chat window, if you leave comments in the chat window, that comes only to me and Dr. Pennington, so that becomes anonymous. So if you want to stay anonymous, you're free and welcome to do so. All of the people who are coming in, you can't see others that are joining, so it's staying anonymous. But if you want to pose a question, it will, it can get posted where everybody will see it. So if you do, you're okay with that, then you would put it in the Q&A box. All right. So again, um, this is Dr. Tanzavati and Dr. Pennington, and we're waiting until about five minutes after the hour before we start. In the meantime, I am going to open it up and, and give Dr. Pennington a warm welcome. Thank you for joining me today and it's so nice to have you. So why don't you give an introduction about yourself? Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, I'm Dr. Lindsay Pennington. I'm a facial plastic surgeon in Shreveport, Louisiana, and I have uh, my own private practice kind of in the old historic South Highlands portion of Shreveport. And uh, I've been open since kind of fall of 2017. So that's my kind of basic history on that front. And uh, I met Dr. Tanzavati through um, kind of a female facial plastics networking group. And it's I'm really excited to be here and doing this with her. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit about myself, uh, Dr. Christina Tanzavati, and I'm also a facial plastic surgeon in uh, Westlake Village, California, which is just north of Malibu and north of um, Beverly Hills, if people aren't familiar with the area. And again, I am also very happy to have met a whole slew of facial plastic surgeons, female facial plastic surgeons. I think it's become quite helpful for me to, you know, just have people to talk about cases, you know, cases as well as how to reopen in this time. Um, so all of us are going through similar challenges and it's helpful to be able to talk to colleagues about how we are reopening so that it's safe for our patients. All right, so let me give it another two more minutes. I have 3.03 on the time. So I'm gonna, uh, if people want to go ahead and put in some questions to begin with. We have uh, the Q&A box at the bottom that you could go ahead and put your questions. Um, if you are interested in rhinoplasty or if you've had rhinoplasty before, even then, um, go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A box. 
and we have an we have a great topic today. I guess we didn't even introduce our topic. Do you want to talk about the topic? Sure. So today we're going to talk about um, rhinoplasty in general, but specifically the differences between a liquid rhinoplasty, which is kind of the name it's it's been termed, but where you do augmentation of the nose in a non-surgical manner by using hyaluronic acid or dermal fillers. Um, and then we're going to compare that and discuss the differences between uh, good candidacy for, you know, injectable or liquid rhinoplasty versus a surgical rhinoplasty, which is kind of the more traditional approach that people are used to hearing about. Yeah. So I think I'll uh, open up the poll because I, before we start, might as well ask this question. So of the people who have attended today, uh, the question is, are you considering a rhinoplasty? And um, there's a lot of information out there that goes over, you know, uh, you know, on my Instagram as well as on social media of patients getting injections with fillers. And it's always a top question when people come in, can I have my nose uh, shaped using fillers without undergoing surgery? So it's to be interesting to see how many of you out there are interested in doing this. All right, I am going to close the poll here and share the results with everybody so you can see. So we have yes, surgical, 30%. Uh, no, there's a lot of people who just say they just wanna learn more. So I guess that's why we're here to kind of talk about the difference between surgery and non-surgery mm -hmm. and to get you at least some information, get you down the path Maybe you don't even know if you would be a surgical candidate or a non-surgical candidate. So this is where um, us as facial plastic surgeons, we do a lot of nose surgery. We do a lot of surgery on the face. And that's truly who you should be seeing uh, to get work done on the face. All right, I'm going to stop sharing this. Next question of those who are considering rhinoplasty, what were your reasons for considering a rhinoplasty? What is the reason you're considering rhinoplasty? And I'll give this uh, about 15, 20 seconds, just to allow everybody to put in their answers. I can't remember if I opened it for you as well on your side. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, I can see them. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. And I'm going to share the results. So some of, the, of, some of you are not considering having one, which is fine. Uh, of the ones who did consider uh, having rhinoplasty, uh, it looks like it's a toss-up between these three, crooked nose, breathing problems, and bump on the bridge. So I guess we're going to have to answer these questions right here when we talk about surgical versus non-surgical here. All right. So... I'm gonna have Dr. Pennington start with her presentation and then I'll take it after her. Great, I'm gonna, got some pictures that I pulled up for y'all that I'm just gonna show now. We can kind of go through. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm Dr. Lindsay Pennington. I'm a facial plastic surgeon in Shreveport, Louisiana. And, um, Basic things that we kind of think about when we're um, meeting our, our patients and doing a physical exam, um, we always do pictures. I personally, I take 2D and 3D pictures as well as do a really good physical exam when I'm looking at a patient for any type of nose procedure, whether it be surgical or non-surgical. So it's um, there's a lot that goes into evaluating the nose. I often tell my patients that rhinoplasty is one of the most difficult um, basically plastic surgery procedures there, there is to offer. So um, there's a lot of subtle things that we look at when we're looking at the nose. There's a lot of anatomical areas. Um, I call it high-priced real estate. There's a lot of important structures in a really small space. So um, when I'm initially looking at a patient, you know, I just look at the general proportions. Does their nose fit their face? Um, is it long? Is it short? Um, is there any noted areas of trauma? Is there scars? Is it crooked? Um, and then I want to take into certain things like asking breathing history, um, any history of allergies, sinus issues, um, you know, basic overall history on that front and very obvious kind of big nose things to look out for as far as trauma, 
lumps, bumps, crookedness. And then there's more subtle things that you're going to want to look at, as in checking out their kind of radix and glabellar area. Um, you're going to want to look at their dorsal hump. You're going to want to look at their nasal tip. You're going to want to palpate their tip, touch and see what their cartilages look and feel like. Um, you're going to want to look inside the nose and see if their septum, which is the middle part of the nose that separates the two sides, if that's straight, if they're complaining about breathing issues, could that be a component that's contributing to it? So there's a lot that goes into just evaluating the nose in general. So it's very important that when you're thinking about any nose procedure, that you should see somebody who's highly specialized in that. So I, I very much think a facial plastic surgeon who has the background to not only make your nose look really good, but keep it functional and keeping you breathing well is really important. So then when you look at a profile picture of the nose, there are certain kind of things that you want to take into consideration. The projection, how far it sticks out from your face, its relationship to your chin, to your lip. Um, those are all things that kind of play into each other. There's a very um, kind of overall aesthetic approach that you need to include looking at all of the surrounding structures as well. So I'm not going to try to get into too much anatomy details. And then um, other stuff to think about. This is... Um, a very kind of vascular area. So whenever you're thinking about potentially exploring injections as an option, um, it's a really risky place to be injecting if you're an uninformed, unexperienced injector. So make sure that you're kind of finding somebody who knows what they're doing and is comfortable with the anatomy. So as you can see, there's blood supply from both sides. Certain areas um, have higher risk than others. So that's something that I always like to educate my patients about in general. So I'm going to talk about liquid rhinoplasty, which is kind of using dermal fillo first, and then I'll talk about um, surgical rhinoplasty. But in general, the term liquid rhinoplasty refers to using an injectable dermal filler um, into the nose to help improve whatever kind of the thing may be that's bothering the patient. So there are certain kind of candidacy things. There are certain things that a liquid rhinoplasty can help with, and there are certain things that it, that it can't help with. So in general, um, for me personally, whenever I'm considering doing an injectable rhinoplasty, I'm gonna use a hyaluronic acid filler. And the reason for that, they commonly go by trade names such as Juvederm or Restylin um, as examples with that. Um, and the reason that I'm gonna to wanna to use a hyaluronic acid filler versus some of the other options is that it is reversible. So if you inject an enzyme, um, Hyalinex is a brand name, but hyaluronic, hyaluronidase, um, it can dissolve. So if you are doing an injection, you come across a complication, having the ability to dissolve that filler can be potentially um, very, very important in kind of reversing that complication and keeping there from being further issues. So always make sure that you are seeing an injector that is being safe about their practices and you ask those questions. So as I mentioned, this is an area where there's a lot of risk associated with having the injection here. There's a lot of blood supply, and there is very little laxity or leeway in the nose of the skin. So if you over inject the area, you can cause pressure necrosis. And there's also risk of that intravascular injection. With that being said, when you're an excellent candidate for liquid rhinoplasty, you get instantaneous results. It's one of the most fun procedures that I do in office because people often come to me, they've been concerned about their nose for years. Um, and within a 10, 15 minute procedure in office, their noses, you know, their defect that they're concerned about, that they've been self-conscious about, is fixed. And they can leave the office with little to no downtime, feeling good and happy. And it's, it's, it's really fun. It's an instant gratification procedure. So in particular, patients that are good candidates are people who um, potentially have a low radix, um, where you need to build up some height here, where that is more often seen in people kind of with ethnic backgrounds. Um, in African-American communities, sometimes Asians, they have a, a lower lying radix and kind of building that up or building the dorsum up can help define the nasal bridge better. Um, people with a large dorsal hump um, that you want to kind of um, be able to disguise by adding a little bit of filler on either side of the hump. Um, can help make it look straighter in their side profiles. Uh, people who have a drooping tip as well, you can kind of put some filler in the tip and kind of help pick the tip up or people who want to define the tip more. Those are all people who are filler good candidates. And I'll kind of, towards the end of the discussion, kind of bring up who is not a great candidate. But in general, with a liquid rhinoplasty, you're adding volume. So if you want your nose to be smaller, if you want your nose to be less wide, um, you're not necessarily going to be a good candidate for a liquid rhinoplasty, but doing a um, surgical rhinoplasty might be a better option for you. So this is a particular patient. She, um, 
as you can see, do I have it? Yeah. So she had, you know, a dorsal hump here that kind of went down. It made it look like her tip curved more than it did. So by adding some filler to this area here and into her tip, we were able to make the dorsum appear smoother, her tip feel um, a little bit more projected, a little bit softer, and a little bit more feminine. Um, she was, you know, this was able to be accomplished with one kind of 30 minute office visit on that end. Great result. And that is often one where when I post this, people are, are surprised that this is a, a result from a liquid rhinoplasty and not from a surgical. So, and she's somebody who's after this and after how happy she was with the result is now going to be talking to me about doing a more permanent option such as a surgical rhinoplasty. Um, this is another patient. You can see had a small dorsal hump here and just felt like her tip was kind of bulbous. And with a larger tip, you're not gonna get smaller, but you can give the illusion of kind of a more defined tip by doing um, an injection. So we added a little bit of filler, helped straighten out her dorsum and helped define her tip a little bit more. Now this patient, she's one that has kind of a lower lying um, kind of dorsal area. She does have a kind of a congenital um, kind of mid-face hypoplasia as well that she's been born with her whole life. But we were able to straighten out her dorsum, kind of define and give her a quote unquote what the patient called a cuter tip. And she was able to feel much more confident about her nose that she'd always kind of been insecure about um, as well with this little hump that was there. This is one of those kind of drooping tips that I described earlier. And so by adding filler to the area here over the dorsum and then into the nasal tip, you can give it that illusion of kind of increased rotation and by it being straighter. So this was a, again, a non-surgical result. It's amazing. It's amazing dramatic, result. Dramatic improvement. And this is another dorsal hump and where the tip appears to droop more um, but once you kind of define that tip with a little bit of filler here and by kind of smoothing it out with the dorsum as well. So um, quick and easy fixes in office with the kind of liquid rhinoplasty. So for the surgical, um, this is where you're going to have to, um, you know, have general anesthesia, have incisions made either on the inside or inside and outside of your nose um, to have your anatomy addressed that way. Um, this is a more permanent solution. Um, and I find that it's a very high satisfaction. This is one of those, when I take the casts off, um, I would say more times than not, patients are crying and saying, thank you. It's, it's really, it's a fun procedure to perform. In addition to, it can have a significant quality of life for people who are having breathing difficulties when you open up their airways. Um, they have improved exercise tolerance. It can decrease snoring. Um, so there's a lot of, um, Pros, pros to doing a surgical rhinoplasty. Now, again, just like the liquid rhinoplasty, anytime you do a procedure, there's risk involved. Um, surgical rhinoplasty has one of the highest revision rates of any plastic surgery there is. So um, upwards of 20%. So one in five people who have surgery on their nose may consider having surgery again to fix something that they don't like about their results. And I think um, that's another reason to really make sure that you research your surgeon, look at their before and after pictures, ask for long-term before and after pictures, pictures that are a year, two years, three years out, um, and just make sure that you've, you've done your homework on that end. Now, who's a good candidate for surgical rhinoplasty? Um, I think people who are healthy and who are gonna be compliant are always good candidates for surgery. But in general, um, when you have very specific anatomic concerns, so um, for surgical rhinoplasty, and this is something that I think Dr. Tanzabadi is gonna talk about some, um, but if you have a wider nose or if your nose is kind of too big for your face, it's over projected, you have a very large dorsal hump, um, those are all things that um, when you want to make the nose smaller, uh, surgery is going to be a better option because that's something we're actually taking volume away instead of adding volume like you would with an injectable rhinoplasty. So this particular patient, she um, was kind of over projected. She was someone you can see how her nose comes out a little bit far for her face. She had a dorsal hump that she um, really didn't like. And then even from the front, she had a very kind of wide lower lateral cartilage there. So we were able to, through a surgical rhinoplasty, um, bring her nose in a little bit closer to her face, so deep projector, and just kind of soften her dorsal hump. And um, she was very happy with the results. It um, fits her face 
kind of much more. And the thing that I tell my patients is when you're looking for a good rhinoplasty result is you don't want people to come up to you and say, oh, if you had surgery, your nose is so cute. You want your nose to kind of blend into your face where your nose just isn't noticeable, where they notice your other really pretty features like your eyes or your lips. And I think with her now, you can kind of, you notice her eyes first before you notice her nose, which kind of dominated her kind of softer, more petite features. This is a patient um, who we would have been able to disguise the hump by adding some filler here, but her nose was already so big for her face um, that it really wouldn't have been a good result for her. And it would have made her nose appear even bigger, even with it being straight. So we were able to kind of soften her nose a little bit, remove some of her dorsal hump, remove some of the height, but it still looked like her nose and not look operated on. She was very happy with these results without overdoing it. Um, this particular, I don't know if that thumbnail's in the way with this one, um, patient had just really large lower lateral cartilage here. So this is something that you would not be able to disguise with filler, because again, filler is one of those things where you'd be adding to the volume when really we needed to be taking away and kind of repositioning and making this area smaller and smoothing this out. So you can see she has a much more defined tip. We've increased her rotation a little bit, and we've even been able to kind of um, change how much of her columella was hanging out previously as well. And again, that's all something that would not be doable with a, a liquid rhinoplasty, but it's very doable in the operating room. So here's one, again, another kind of overprojected nose. And um, she is one that when she smiles, she got a really significant kind of drooping tip. By. So we were able to decrease some of the volume here by bringing her nose in, taking down this hump, and then I was able to reinforce the um, kind of strength of her tip so that when she smiles, her tip doesn't dive down. As you can see, it kind of dived down more before and we were able to kind of keep that up. So her nostrils don't look quite as, as flared on that front. This is one, she had a kind of a small dorsal hump, but again, wanted a more defined tip and a smoother, smoother nose here. And again, to get that with filler would have been adding volume. Um, and she wanted small, small, small <laughs> within, within reason. She was one that um, showed me a picture of Ariana Grande and wanted her nose to match that. So within reason, <laughs> we, we worked within those, those guidelines, but she got a, a beautiful result. It's subtle, soft, and feminine. This is one patient with a history of significant trauma, uh, previous history of septoplasty, rhinoplasty, and then um, trauma prior to those surgeries and then trauma post those surgeries. So as you can see, um, kind of significant deviation here um, and then just kind of a round bulbous tip. And I was able to kind of recreate her, her nasal dorsum here with a combination of uh, cartilage and uh, fascia. To, and you can see that she's much straighter now. She's got a nice little light reflex all down here. And um, that kind of collapsed area there was able to be rebuilt. And it would be really hard to rebuild a collapsed area with filler that wouldn't kind of obstruct the nasal airway or potentially compromise the surrounding tissues. So you can see improvement here um, by removing some of the scar tissue that was here and kind of rebuilding that dorsum. And she was so excited she could breathe for the first time after like 15 years. So here's another one, really significant over projection, deviated. Um, and this is again, not something that would be able to be addressed with filler. You can't, um, you can give the illusion of a straighter nose by adding a little bit of volume on one side or the other. Um, but to completely straighten out a nose like this one would, would be impossible to do with filler. Um, and we were able to deproject, make the nose smaller, fit her face a little bit better and uh, straighten her out significantly and, and improve her breathing in addition to the improved cosmesis of just having a nose that kind of fits her face better that doesn't draw significant attention on that end. So just a little contact info for me, but I, I can sh share this again at the, the end of the conversation, but just a brief, brief overview of some of the things that you can address with both uh, surgical and uh, filler. On that end. So, Dr. Tanzavani, yeah. anything to add? <laughs> that was amazing. Those revision rhinoplasties, I just want to say this is one of the reasons why you need to see somebody who is trained in doing lots of nose surgery, not just um, a rhinoplasty surgeon who's a pl general plastic surgeon. We work on functional noses in improving not just the aesthetics, but also the breathing because facial plastic surgeons have 
a board certification both in ear, nose, and throat. So we have five years of training in just head and neck surgery and focusing on the nose. And then we also do additional training just for facial aesthetics. So um, that being said, I'm gonna just uh, showcase a couple of pictures from my end. I'm gonna try to make it fun. I know there are a couple questions in the chat window already, but I am going to, um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, and I am going to just show my presentation. Oop, no, I start off. Okay, <laughs> showed some, some answers there. All right, so um, I'm gonna speed through so that we're on time, uh, but I wanna first go by, uh, from hearing what Dr. Pennington just shared, I think this would be a good one to then ask all of you. Uh, let's see if I could, how do I get the poll? That's what I need to do. I'm trying to get the poll here. Ah, shoot. You get the answer right there. <laughs> ah, well, so you already know what the answer is. The answer to this, I have some trouble just kind of getting the pointer right there. Um, the answer to this uh, inject or this um, before and after is this was a filler injection. And just as Dr. Pennington had um, talked about with her injections, you know, when we have a small hump and a droopy tip that has this illusion of a droopy tip, fillers are great for a small hump. When it becomes a bigger hump or a bigger nose, then it becomes harder to do. But in this case, you could see, well, her lashes kind of covered this whole radix area where we injected, but we did inject um, in the radix. And then I also injected right in that super tip um, area just to create a little rotation to the tip. Um, and that she didn't, she didn't ever have a super tip. So we tried to create some without overdoing it and creating too much projection, making it too big, but just enough to rotate her tip. So it gives the illusion, even though that's not truly where her tip is, we've just raised the tip to a different position. And so in this case, a small hump and a droopy tip are great for using fillers. So the next one, I'm going to try to do this without, let's see if I could do this. All right, so question here is, what do you think this was from? Was this a filler or a surgical case? I'm gonna give some, I don't have the poll up, but I'm just going to see what people think. I'm gonna give you some time to think, and then I'll just share the result here. So in this case, this was surgery. And if you see the bridge of the nose, she has, um, and I'll show you from the front, that way you can see it, but you could have, I could have done filler in this case, but the problem here was also she had a very, uh, she had a hanging columella, and you'll see it on another picture, um, how, how her columella was hanging, but she had also an over-projected nasal tip. So I'll kind of showcase if I have the side one today. Oh. Sorry. Um, and then from the front, if you look at the picture, her tip was also asymmetric. So this would have been hard to do, trying to correct that just with fillers alone. So if we did so, it would make her nose look wider. So this was both a refinement of the nasal tip, getting correction of any asymmetries. So asymmetries in the nasal tip are hard using fillers. I have done it for revision cases in which a patient had previous surgery. But again, I always tell them this is not 100% um, going to look perfect. It's going to be better. Um, so you can deal with some asymmetries, but it's not ever going to look as good as what you could get with surgery. All right, so this patient, um, I'm gonna have you take a look as well. And again, this is, question is whether this was filler or surgery. What do you think, Dr. Pennington? My screen is not changing. It's mine is still on the very first picture. Oh. Huh. It's PowerPoint. Resume. You share. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, the last like three slides or the last three things that you talked about, like I was just on the first picture. Hmm. Okay. Let's see if that works now. Yes, I see this, at least a blonde with earrings. Yeah, okay. 
gosh, this is a little snafu here. Um, so this was surgery, okay? And the reason here was she had an overprojected. She has a, you can see also like your case where you had um, the upper lip is retracted back. So the mid face is a little weak, but she had an overprojected nose. So the nasal tip was overprojected and she had a hanging columella, which the columella is the portion that is underneath the nose that is hanging down right above the lip. In that, in her case, that it was showcasing the nostril too much. And so what we what I did was lifted the columella, lifted, raised the tip as well as take took down the hump. So there's a couple of issues that we did with this case. Um, so in here, um, this picture you could see was also crooked. So there's asymmetry as well. You can see some asymmetry of the nostrils still there afterwards, but improved. And then you can see that there was a cleft in her nasal tip. So the tip is also droopy. And when she smiled, it was also droopy. That's a great point. Yeah. All right, so this one, is this filler or surgery? <laughs> I think this one is easy to, to kind of tell. This is the ideal patient, what, we're, what Dr. Pennington uh, noticed, noted before, which is the fact that this is a filler patient because she had a low radix and she needed a little bit of tip definition, not a lot, but an Asian rhinoplasty or um, ethnic noses where we have either African-American or Asian nose where the bridge is lowered, the radix, which is in between the eyes is lowered. Uh, raising the radix with fillers is great to do. It's easy to do in the office. Now, I do also do Asian rhinoplasty where I take cartilage, I dice it, and I wrap it with fascia. That is, a four and a half hour surgery compared to doing this for 30 minutes. So of course we have patients who request this. It's easier, uh, but there's always risk with fillers. And as Dr. Pennington noted earlier, with the vascularity of the nose, you really have to make sure you're seeing a facial plastic surgeon or a plastic surgeon who really understands the anatomy and knows how to avoid the vasculature. And then from the front, you can see how it improved. If you look at the space between her eyes, her eyes look actually closer to each other, even though it's an illusion. So just by bringing up that bridge, you can see now that space that was between her eyes, it looked very flat to begin with. And then after, by raising the bridge, it just created this illusion that the eyes are closer. So this is raising the radix and also creating a little bit of tip definition. Here's another Asian patient, also low radix. And in this case, her tip was over rotated. So her, her nostrils show and her tip looks over um, rotated up. So in the goal here was to lower the tip to make it rotated down to kind of give it a more of a balance. So this was done also with fillers. Again, before and after. All right, so with this one, was this filler or surgery? What do you think, Dr. Pennington? I'm gonna say surgery. Yeah, well, this, so this has to do with a crooked nose. Crooked noses are hard using fillers if the crookedness is really bad. Um, hers is okay, I mean, we could, I could have done fillers, but the problem was she also had breathing issues. So the reason to do surgery is also breathing issues. If there is a narrow middle vault, which you can see that the middle third of her nose, she has a narrowing there. It goes from wide to narrow back to wide. That narrow third of the nose is causing her trouble to breathe. And so this is what we did with, I opened up the nasal valve through uh, using spurtographs, which kind of widened that area area. So this is crooked nose and a narrow middle vault and breathing issues. So this is surgery. Here's another case which Dr. Pennington noticed, noted earlier, and this has to do with a wide nasal base. So she also had surgery. And in this case, it was because the nostril brace, particularly with ethnic noses, when the nostrils are flared, or the sill, which is what we did here. Uh, I reduced the sill, which is the 
um, size of the nostrils. And then when we talk about the flare, it's more of the outside curve of the nostril. That is an alar plasty, whereas the width of the black portion, the, the nostril opening is called the sill. And I reduce the sill as well. So this made um, the patient have a smaller looking appearing nose. And you can't do that with fillers because fillers will add volume as Dr. Pennington said. So adding volume wouldn't work in this case because you're trying to reduce the size of the nose. So mostly with ethnic noses, I have to uh, proceed with surgery rather than fillers. All right. In this case, this was um, a revision rhinoplasty case. So this one was surgery. And she had, her story was that she had three previous septoplasty rhinoplasty cases. So she had a septoplasty and she woke up and it was deviated. And then they had to go back within a month and try to fix it, came out, it was not better. And she did it again. So by re this repetitive treatment, this is one where I avoid doing fillers because you can see the tip of the nose is twisted. And when you put fillers in this area, you, there runs a risk of you going into some vascularity because anytime any surgery has been done, there's scar tissue and you don't know what has happened to the vasculature. So vasculature can change. And so it's not the same as it was before surgery. And so it's very risky to do fillers in these cases. So this was before and after. You could see how irregular her tip was. And so I had to put graphs to kind of support and reoriented, uh, reorient the cartilages so they were laying more symmetric. And then side pictures, and then from the bottom. So that was very twisted and we tried to straighten, straighten that up. Okay, this is another revision rhinoplasty case. Just to showcase, this was um, ethnic as well. Thick skin, that's another reason why fillers would not be helpful. Thick skin because it would just make the nose appear wider. I mean, it's very hard to take care of tip definition when you have thick skin. But the other reason is he had a cleft lip palate um, and he had cleft rhinoplasty when he was very young and he was still having this irregularity where there was a deviation to his septum and you could see the nose twisted over to the left side. And these cases are hard, particularly because now it's being done when they're much older. But I tried to get, um, if you could see sort of that light reflex, it's straighter as well as the nostril uh, alar rim is pulled up to be more even with the other side. All right, so I tried to, um, kind of categorize this. So we are, uh, as what Dr. Pennington said, this is sort of an overview of the category between filler and surgery and which one you would choose. For a smaller hump, then filler would be appropriate. As the hump becomes larger, it's harder to hide. So that would be more surgery. If you have a droopy tip and it's mild, that can be fixed by putting filler in an appropriate position to make it seem like it's rotated up. Also, if you have a wide nostril or alar base, let me just pull out of this so I could use my mouse, otherwise I can't see. Um, so a large hump, uh, a big nose, uh, wide nostrils or alar base, an ethnic nose with thick skin, a crooked nose, or in cases where they have to have um, a revision because they've had previous surgery, that would be indications for surgery. For filler, all the pictures that we've demonstrated, Dr. Pennington and I have shown some small humps, some droopy tips, um, patients with thinner skin who have maybe a low radix, so ethnic Asian noses that have low noses, uh, low radix, that can be addressed with fillers. Mild tip deformity, so it's just a small um, asymmetries, those can all be addressed using fillers. But as they become more complicated, complex, thick skin, bigger noses, large humps, that's where we really have to address that with surgery. All right. Did you have anything else to add, Dr. Pennington? No, I can. I agree with all the above. It was like that was a very good examples of kind of ethnic noses and, and wider alar bases there that are really difficult to address in general. <laughs> So we have a couple of questions that were posted in the chat window. I'm going to stop sharing on my end so we could go back to the chat. 
And let's start off with this first question. How long does the liquid rhinoplasty last? So with that, some of it depends on, in my opinion, what filler you use. So um, as far as the fillers that I personally use in the nose, I use uh, either standard Juvederm Ultra, Ultra Plus, or Voluma. Um, mm -hmm. And so depending on one of those you use will kind of depend on the longevity. Each one of them individually has varying longevities. Um, but I find that filler in the nose tends to last longer than it does in other locations as well. Um, so as a kind of standard guideline, like Voluma, the company says can last up to 24 months. I find realistically when you're injecting it in the mid face, I tell my patients, you know, 12 to 18 months before you kind of, kind of want to come in and get a, a top off. But in the nose, I do think that 24 months is very reasonable to, to expect from a Voluma injection. Um, for standard kind of Juvederm Ultra to Ultra Plus, I would say um, more like 12 to 18 months. Um, when I do Ultra in the lips, I say it lasts six to nine months in the nose. I'm going to say you're going to get a solid 12 months out of it. And with an Ultra Plus, um, probably 12 to 18 months. So some of it depends on, on which filler you, you're using. Using. Yeah. Um, I typically say that it really depends on the patient and how fast they go through things because I can have a patient where I built up the bridge and it lasted two years and they come back and it's still there. Mm -hmm. So, and then the next patient, it lasted six months because they're putting on glasses or they have something on the bridge of their nose or, you know, it just, it can dissipate. So particularly right above, right at that radix, if they've got a hump right below that, then it's hard because that can also go off to the sides with the filler. So it can migrate, fillers can migrate. So I, I try not to say that it lasts, um, you know, it's a range. I always tell patients it's a range, so. I agree. Um, the question here also, is there a risk with liquid rhinoplasty? So I kind of touched on that a little bit, um, but yes, I mean, there's a risk with any procedure anywhere that you do, but particularly with liquid rhinoplasty compared to say injecting your lips versus injecting your nose. Injecting your nose is a lot riskier procedure. It requires a lot more kind of detailed, intimate knowledge of the anatomy of your nose, um, of where the right places are to inject. Um, the risk of intravascular injection. And that's a spot where if you get, and also if you over inject, you can just get straight up pressure necrosis by adding too much volume to the nose too quickly. So um, that's why it's so important to choose an experienced injector who's not only experienced in injecting, but experienced in injecting the nose specifically, and who knows the anatomy well, but who's also trained in how to handle complications. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but like and I, I will tell you that I've had one of my own, so it is not some, it happens to the best of us, and you just have to make sure your injector is able to um, diagnose the problem and fix it right away. So we have always have a lot of hyaluronidase available on um, in our refrigerator, and we make sure that we have always at least a thousand units of hyaluronidase available. So that's that's important. Yes, I agree. Um, it says here, how long is the recovery for rhinoplasty? So I tell my patients, um, and it, it, some of it depends on what you do for a living. Um, I say after seven days, you're good to go back to work for most of my patients. But like one of the before and afters that I showed, she is a flight mechanic um, in the military and she has to wear like big pressure compressive masks for breathing and for flight trials. And so that's somebody who she's gonna need to take off of work a little bit longer, make um, kind of backup plans, do light duty for, for lack of, of better terms. If you have a desk job, you can go back to work after seven days. Um, my hairdressers, my waitresses, people who are on their feet, working, mm -hmm. using their arms and legs a lot, I say it's more likely two weeks just because you're gonna wanna take it easy and you don't wanna increase blood flow and increase swelling that close to, to post-op. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think it all depends also on how much we're doing. So a person who has just a bump and we're taking down the hump and then we just put a cast and they're not wearing a mask or whatever um, for their job, that's something that they could recover quickly within a week if the bruising goes away quickly and they go back to work. So it really depends on how complicated the case may be. For my revision rhinoplasty cases, I always tell them that there's gonna be more swelling than the first time. And so you want to at least give your yourself with the social downtime, um, you're gonna to want to say at least a month because it's not gonna look 
great right away at one week or two weeks. Sometimes it will take longer. So I always tell my patients, you just have to be aware of these things. And some people are not um, so keen on, you know, um, letting people know that they've had surgery while others are okay with letting people know that they just had surgery. So it really depends on the patient. All right, it says here, do glasses affect um, if you can get a rhinoplasty? So I'm wondering if that's having to do with revision, I mean, with the, um, the liquid rhinoplasty or just regular rhinoplasty. Yeah, so for me um, on either, it doesn't mean that you are not a candidate or are a candidate for it, um, but I do have my patients post-op after um, surgery if they are glasses wear, um, either for like tape their glasses up to their forehead here. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a fun little apparatus that one of our patients recently found on Amazon that you can um, wear and hang your glasses off. And it, My patient did that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it keeps there from just being pressure. Because the thing that I tell my patients is a lot of times when you're doing osteotomies and for lack of better terms, we're, we're breaking the bones in, in your nose. Um, when you break your bones in your arm, you wear a cast for six to eight weeks. And when you've done your nose, you've worn a cast for a week, maybe two. Um, and so those bones are still settling into place. So anything that you do that could potentially put pressure on or adjust the placement of those shouldn't be done. So I, I for four to six weeks after surgery, don't like people wearing glasses. And then ideally like sunglasses, um, I tell people to not wear for three months after surgery. So, wow, really? Yeah. Three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would really say six weeks, um, but I, I'll also- months, I get six weeks. I, I'm, I'm concerned that if I say six weeks, that it's gonna be- <laughs> Four weeks? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, I, most of my patients have been following, you know, my guidelines, but uh, one of the things I'll try to do is that I will also give them a mold. Um, so I'll give them a cast that's uh, that I've used. So I will re create a new mold and I'll send that home with them. So if they want to like, you know, for whatever reason, particularly in this coronavirus area, you're gonna wear the cast and put on the mask because you have to, all these people are wearing masks. We're gonna, oh, so sorry. Uh, that was on delivery. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Sorry, my, my dog. Uh, just wait for him to stop barking. Okay. <laughs> All right. Somebody's at the door. I think somebody's at the door too. All right. So um, that, that was good. So what about for injections, for fillers? Do you routinely... Um, have people, do you give them instructions on how, when they can start wearing glasses? I, I say two weeks. Two weeks? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I've routinely said one week, but you know, before then I was doing like a day. And as I saw more and more where the, the filler would go away here, I was like, no, you can't wear glasses for a week, but maybe I'll, I'll say two weeks. But particularly you do have to wait some time before you wear glasses again, because it will cause the filler to shift. Um, so question here is, can you explain a closed rhinoplasty and how you know if you're a candidate? I guess we didn't go over closed versus open, huh? We, we didn't. Um, so for me, um, a closed rhinoplasty versus open. So closed, you make incisions on the inside of the nose, where with open, you make an incision on the insides and outside, right here in the columella. There's a little incision there and you're able to kind of pick up the whole skin envelope and have access to all of the nasal tip and the dorsum. Um, for me personally, when I performed, and my fellowship director loved closed rhinoplasty, uh, it was <laughs> and trying to learn rhinoplasty in general from somebody who loves closed rhinoplasty can be difficult because you're not seeing everything and they kind of just go in there and move their hands around and it seems like magic when they're done. Um, but when you're just addressing kind of maybe a smaller dorsal hump um, or just kind of the um, kind of posterior portions of the lower, like the little cartilages here, kind of the topper portions of that, when you're doing very kind of small tip work or a small dorsal hump, those are all things that can be done through a closed rhinoplasty. Um, and I've gotten some, the nice part about that, there's less downtime with it, there's less potential for scar tissue, less risk of um, issues with the skin envelope healing. Um, so being a good candidate for it is great, but I would say that probably the majority of people that I see are the concerns that they have. I probably do 75% of my cases open. Um, so it's more just kind of um, 
finding the right candidate. If you're a great candidate, I'm happy, the patient's happy, um, but not everybody, in my opinion, is a candidate for closed. But some of that is surgeon dependent as well. Right. But I find when you're doing more minor, minor tweaks that it's, a, it's better to do closed. Yeah, I typically prefer doing uh, open as well. And I would say that's the majority of my cases. I'd say it's about 80, 20. Um, closed, I reserve for those who are just really addressing the bridge. If there's a little tip work, if it's just refinement, tiny, tiny little bit of refinement, definitely can be closed. But anything more than that, then I, it's open at that point. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right, is there an age limit for either procedure? And what is the cost comparison? So for age limits for me, um, for my female patients, um, you can do younger. Um, I kind of keep my, depending, the youngest I've done is like 15 for like an elective, like if there's no trauma associated or anything like that. And, and it was just like a really bad nose. It was one of those things where I didn't think she'd change her mind later. Um, but usually for my females, 15, 16. Males, I like you to be 16, 17, ideally. Um, and so that's kind of, as far as being young, the direction, I, I kind of like you to be kind of fully formed and growing. Cause you're, even when you're an adult and you have a rhinoplasty, it changes over time and over years. So if you're young and you still have cartilages growing and it's not fully matured, um, the nose can potentially change more and cause issues down, down the road. So, yeah. Um, I agree. And there's also issues when I have a patient who's younger, a female patient, but they're electing or they're saying that they're going to, they will get pregnant at some point because they're wanting to get pregnant mm -hmm. They're thinking about getting pregnant. I usually tell them that it can change from pregnancy as well because I've seen that happen. Um, not my own patients, but I've had to do revision rhinoplasties for patients who did showcase changes after pregnancy. Um, so that is something to be aware of for females. Um, the, also, the question is the upper age limit. Uh, I know one of the respondents who put this in the Q&A asked about the upper age limit. I don't have necessarily a limitation unless when it comes to more of their uh, safety for undergoing general anesthesia because most of my rhinoplasty cases are done under general anesthesia unless I'm doing something like an alar plasty which is narrowing the nostrils or doing some little bit of work that doesn't require me to do a complete you know open and all that so for those cases then uh, then maybe I could, there's no upper age. But for purposes of general anesthesia, it's really about whether they're safe to undergo general anesthesia. So we have some factors that we look at to make sure that you're not in that um, high risk group. So an ASA or what we call a, a level risk by the anesthesiologist that they grade, anywhere for a one or two, I think I'd be okay with. Anytime it gets to three or four, um, definitely I would be... Um, trying to persuade them not to have surgery. <laughs> I, I agree on that. There's no upper age limit for me. It's more of a, just your general overall health um, and kind of your motivations and what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I do have also for Asian rhinoplasty because I do build up the nose using cartilage from the rib sometimes. Um, I will tell you though, I do have an upper age limit on using rib cartilage. So I did one on a 52 year old and that was a little bit tough. So as it starts to get calcified, it's not very uh, good to grab rib. And so I, in the upper age limit on those cases, I'll say to them that we'll have to use cadaver uh, rib cartilage, but it doesn't mean that it's a contraindication to doing the surgery in them. All right, it says here, so uh, does the cost of a surgical rhinoplasty depend on what you are wanting done? Uh, I have a, you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like for me personally, um, not necessarily kind of, I have a basic price for surgical rhinoplasty. Um, but if you're pairing it with like a functional rhinoplasty that can affect the price. Cause if you're already doing a big insurance portion and you're just like doing a tweak for cosmetics, um, that can take down the price. And then, um, but if you're a revision rhinoplasty, that is also more expensive just because it's more time consuming and there's more risk and there's a lot more that goes into it. So there's always a range kind of depending on your anatomy and your previous history and what the goals are. Right. At that end. 
So I operate at a surgical center that bases their costs for anesthesi the anesthesiologist as well as the surgical facility based on time. So for my part, I do have uh, a slated cost depending on whether it's surgery versus uh, whether it's, sorry, a regular rhinoplasty, primary rhinoplasty versus a revision rhinoplasty. So there is a distinction in those two, but I don't have necessarily a complexity of the surgical rhinoplasty where I have different, you know, different prices there. It really does come down to basis on time. So the time will change the cost of the rhinoplasty for the patient themselves. Uh, and then our cost for revision rhinoplasty, of course, is more expensive because there's a lot uh, more <laughs> that we have to, to deal with and the nuances of getting it just right for a revision case. They are very tough. Um, so anybody who says it's easy revision, no. <laughs> All right. Jomo, sorry, uh, no names here. <laughs> I have had a retinal bleed with macular swelling currently in treatment for three years. Because of the vascularity in the nasal area, could surgical rhinoplasty cause further eye issues with the osteotome and breaking of the cartilage? Well, this is a very specific question. Uh, let me reread that because I got to <laughs> digest this. I've had a retinal bleed with macular swelling currently in treatment for three years. Because of the vascularity in the nasal area, could surgical rhinoplasty cause further eye issues um, with breaking of the cartilage or breaking of the, the bones? What do you think? So, I mean, I would not think that it would, but I would, in this particular scenario, because if, you know, when we did osteotomies and we had kind of the nasal swelling and stuff from other patients, he, in theory, we, if this was an issue, we would be causing potential mm -hmm. vision and that should, you know, vision issues. And that could be something that we need to list on our consents. Um, and so that's not something that I can think of physiologically how it could cause an issue, but it's also something that I am not up to date on retinal bleeds and macular swelling, just it's outside of my wheelhouse is not specializing in eye stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I would definitely get, have a discussion with your, you know, ophthalmologist and um, go into detail there and make sure and get clearance prior to doing any rhinoplasty. Right. But off the bat, I don't, I don't see why it would cause an issue. Right. I would see um, more of an issue if we were planning on having liquid rhinoplasty, uh, right. that if there's any pressure necrosis, like you mentioned earlier, uh, with the filler putting pressure on the vasculature, that could have an effect on your eyes because it can push back towards the eyes. So with that, I would suggest, highly suggest that you'd be a surgical candidate <laughs> rather than a non-surgical <laughs> candidate. Um, all right, some more questions. How do we know if we are choosing the right surgeon if it is from a different area or state we live in? And we can't find many reviews on a rhinoplasty. Um, well, again, anytime you're considering surgery, surgery, I think that you should meet with multiple surgeons. I think it's really important that um, it's just like if you were buying a car or buying shoes, you're not gonna like, you know, buy the first pair that you see or you, you should, you know, this is the bigger decision, it's your nose, you have one. Um, mm -hmm. So I always recommend um, definitely doing your research, um, looking online, looking at their, their personal pictures that they post um, of their before and afters on social media or their website, um, looking for reviews um, and then meeting the surgeon and asking them questions. A lot of times, I know for me, I have a lot of patients that aren't comfortable with me sharing their before and after pictures on mm -hmm. social media because there, there's some privacy issues with that, but there are some that let me show their pictures in office during surgical consult, so I have more pictures that I get to show in office than I do get to share online, um, and so that makes a difference, and a lot of times it's just chemistry of does your surgeon listen to you? Do you, under, you know, do they understand your needs? Are they hearing what you want and kind of... Um, able to, to do that. So I think a lot of it is just chemistry, bedside manner, um, feeling listened to, feeling heard, feeling safe. And then um, again, looking at before and after pictures. I can't stress more um, that that. I would also add just the tool of using the morphing software that your, your surgeon does with you because sometimes what you have discussed is important to you and then they morph it and you're not quite along the same page. It's not to say that your surgeon doesn't understand you. You may need to just voice that concern and get it just right when you're going over that uh, morphing. So don't feel, feel free to speak up with your surgeon. Some people just feel like, 
okay, well then that wasn't the right surgeon for me. But sometimes you need to voice exactly what you're looking for. And coming with pictures is very helpful, I think. It is, it is. And when I, whenever I do my 3D morphing with my patients, I always like have, I, I morph it with them in the room while we're looking at it together. And I ask them, do you want me to try anything else? Do you like it? Do you not like it? And if they're not jumping up and down, super excited, I've obviously not done something right. Mm -hmm. And as from a patient side, you don't always know the words, you know, of like this area or this area, you can just overall look and you can see, Hey, I, I'm not sure what I don't like about it, but I don't love it. And if they don't love they're morphed, then we need to play with it some more and spend some more time. Right. So you should love your morphed picture and your surgeon should be aiming for that. And if you don't, then there's a miscommunication. Right. So what is the cost for a liquid rhinoplasty? Do you so, have, do you have a cost? I, I don't try to discuss cost too much because it really, um, I have such a range for my liquid rhinoplasty. I have different um, parameters. So there's a rhinoplasty one, rhinoplasty two, rhinoplasty three, so do you for, have a I don't, so normally the way that I do filler cost in my practice is I basically charge per syringe, but with um, liquid rhinoplasty, I don't charge per syringe. There's a flat fee and it mm -hmm. comes with basically two visits. And so the first visit I do some injecting, the second visit you come back and I do some injecting and that's it. Both of those visits are included, um, whether it takes a lot of filler or a little filler, it's the same. And I just kind of counsel people that it's going to, it's, it's going to be slow um, because I don't want to build up anything too quickly and that to expect two visits where they're getting at least injections on two visits minimum. But all of that is included and it's just one flat fee for that. Right. So. Well, that's good. I, I What I like to do is um, just because just like we have a revision rhinoplasty cost, I do have a revision rhinoplasty, non-surgical rhinoplasty cost as well because it is more complicated and there's higher risk of um, complications. So I, I do charge a little bit more for that. Uh, but uh, if you do want to know the exact cost, please feel free to send uh, Dr. Pennington a message. You could send it also through the, the chat window. And then one of our team will get a hold of you and be able to uh, get you in for a consultation. And Dr. Pennington would love to see you in for a consultation and me and myself as well. Uh, we both offer virtual consultations. So we're happy to talk with you and discuss more about that. Another question here is if I've had trauma to my nose, I play contact sports regularly. How do I know if I should see a plastic surgeon and not just go to urgent care? Also, how soon after trauma? So if you've had trauma to your nose um, and if you go to an urgent care and they tell you your nose is broken, that's what you should be seeing you know, a plastic surgeon and immediately the much, the closer to injury, the better. Um, Cause it's one of those things that if you have displaced bones, that's something that, that can, um, you know, they say up to seven days, but I would really like to see it within the first three or four days. Um, and usually your swelling is the worst by three or four days. So ideally as soon as possible and trying to kind of reset those bones, um, which can sometimes be done in clinic patient dependent. Um, but a lot of times we can just get you in quickly to the, to the outpatient surgery center, sedate you a little bit and reset those and get a cast on there. And it can potentially save you money, scar tissue, heartache, surgery down the road. If you come in and we're able to kind of reset it quickly on that yeah. end. So Much you easier should, to take care of it. Early. Yeah. If you've been told that you have broken bones or there's an obvious deformity, um, that's when I would um, come in to see a plastic surgeon. Yeah. Great, great answer. So I'm going to have one, we're going to answer just one more question before we close it because we are at the top of the hour. We've spent about an hour with you guys. I hope everyone has enjoyed this talk and I can see some names of people I recognize as well as Dr. Pennington, I'm sure. Um, this last question is, are we able to send pictures in to get an estimate cost or do we have to come in first if we aren't from the area? Uh, that just depends. I, I like to, if you sending pictures, I like to do a, like an actual consult, you know, virtual consult over the phone, over the computer, and I can give a, an estimate. And then I always, always, always before I will 100% book surgery, need a physical exam. And, and that's how I do it. Even if the exam is the kind of the day before surgery. Um, mm -hmm. but, but ideally, especially with noses, I think physical exam is really important, but you can get mm -hmm. a, a definite cost through pictures and a virtual consult. 
that's what I recommend as well. So you can send in your pictures, but what we're going to give you is probably a range. It doesn't only depend on the pictures. We really need to talk to you and determine what you're looking for because that determines how the complexity and what we're doing for our surgery or also for the fillers. So thank you for that question. And if you want to book your virtual consultation, uh, please send your information in through actually the chat window. You could do that. Or why don't you, Dr. Pangin, do you have a location where they can book their virtual consultation? Uh, we just have them call the office or email us, and that's a that's the easiest way for us. Um, let's post this to everybody then. I'm just going to write this in the chat window. What is your phone number that they can call it? 318. 31. Do you want to type it? Go ahead and yeah. type it. And, and it goes in the chat. Mm -hmm. okay. 318 216. Thank you for everybody's questions. Um, such great questions that were posted. Very good questions. And Dr. Pennington just posted her phone number. Um, you can reach us at our website and the contact page. We just changed our website and it is now live. We love our new website. Please feel free to go and, you know, check it all out. But in our contact page, you could put your information, your name and information, and we'll be able to reach out to you. We also have a link that you can uh, just click if you go to my Instagram, which is Faces by DRT. If you go to my Instagram, you can also find a link to make your appointment there as well. So uh, we also have a question. What is Dr. Pennington's email? Oh, I, I just put it on there. Info at PenningtonFacialPlastics.com. Perfect. All right. Great. Same thing for me. Uh, mine is info at... I love how we both use info. <laughs> Perfect. All right. That was great. It was a great, it was great catching up with you, Dr. Pennington. It was great oh, talk you. You put together and you had amazing results. I have to say. Thank you. You too. Who okay. has not seen Dr. Pennington? You have to book your virtual consultation. If you're close to her, please book your virtual consultation with her. Come on in. All right. I'm going to go home and feed a hungry baby. So. All right. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you.